Good morning, men. Please go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. Let's begin this morning our series with a shout out. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this one. Last, last week we did somebody in uh, Colombia, Bogota. Uh, this week we're doing some men over in Chula Vista, California, uh, the men's ministry at IESP Church. 80 men who've been meeting for six years, 80 men for six years. Their leader is Enrique Melado. And so I wonder if you had to join me in giving a rousing man of the mirror welcome to the men's ministry at IESP Church. One, two, three, hoorah. Welcome, guys. We're really glad to have you with us. All right, so the name of the series is Hanging Out with Jesus. And today we're going to talk about the story of Judas betraying Jesus for money is the title of the message. So I uh, went online this morning, and I looked for the 100 least popular names for baby boys. <laughs> Judas wasn't even on the list, nor was Ichabod. But I did look up Judas and its popularity over the years since 1880. It's interesting, uh, according to Social Security Administration, they report uh, names of babies that have been used uh, five or more times, five or more times. So in, in the years between 1880 and 1968, the Social Security reported no babies. Now, it could have been four, three, or two, or one that had been named that. But until 1969, nobody <laughs> named their, their baby Judas. And it's interesting. I guess it's a reflection of the times. There are 10 years between then and now when no babies uh, or less than five babies have been reported as been, having been named Judas. But uh, since 1993, uh, there have been babies named Judas every year. And it's kind of, a, it's a little bit of an increase. I, I didn't do a kind of a, I didn't do any kind of regression analysis to figure out what exactly the, the trajectory of that is and all that, if I even said that right. Uh, but if you didn't know, I shouldn't have said that because you would have been confused and thought I actually knew what I was talking about. But anyway, the point is, is that, that uh, it kind of looks like a little bit of a, ref of a, ref a, ref a reflection of the times where people have kind of lost the, the whole memory of the Judas story. But we're going to bring that back to life this morning. And so uh, let's start by looking at the text uh, and what happens when we betray Jesus for money. Matthew 27, verse 1. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. You'll notice on your outline, there's a passage here in another part of the Bible, a par parallel passage, which gives a little bit more amplification of that. I think it's, uh, is it Luke or John? I can't remember. Luke? John? Luke. There's a passage there in Luke. We're not going to look at that. We've kind of processed through the trial in previous messages, but you can look at that later if you want to. What we want to do, though, <coughs> is, is, is look at this story. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned... He was seized with remorse. Interesting. And he returned the 30 silver coins. He made restitution to the chief priests and elders. And then he said, I have sinned. I have sinned. And he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. So, What's obvious in this text? What's obvious in this text is that Judas betrayed Jesus for money, and he knew it. He knew he had done something sinful. And, but why did he do it? Well, he did it for the money. He did it for the money. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 6, tells us that, that uh, he was a thief, he, that he regularly stole money from the common purse of the disciples. So in life, 
there are men who follow Jesus. As it turns out, Judas almost certainly, I'm not 100% certain, but Jesus said that, that uh, in John 17, I have not lost any except one, uh, the son of perdition given over to destruction. So I don't know if that was the destruction of his soul or the destruction of his body, but anyway, whatever the case, um, Judas um, went to the left when he should have gone to the right. And in this life right now, there are men uh, who follow Jesus. Uh, hopefully no one in this room or online is following Jesus, but not on the basis of an abiding faith and surrender to Jesus. But, that said, every week, every week, multiple times every week, I run into men or I hear about men who have done a Romans 1. They've exchanged the truth of God for a lie and the glory of God for an idol. Now, when men make idols, there are a couple of ways that you can make an idol. It's a couple of ways, a couple of ways you, can, you, can, uh, you can go, go off track here. You can make an exclusive idol. In other words, you can just completely walk away, you can completely exclude Christ from your life. You can, you can, you can do that. You can, you can uh, be, in, an, be in, a, uh, in an immoral sexual relationship with one woman. You can have an exclusive immoral relationship, you know? You can do that. But you can also commit adultery. Uh, you can uh, be married to one woman and be living a sexually immoral life with another woman. So you can do the same thing with God, spiritual adultery. So you can actually be a Christian and still commit spiritual adultery. In fact, the Bible calls idolatry, calls it spiritual adultery. In the case of Judas, he was following Jesus. In the case of many men that we meet every week, they are, they are following Jesus. Some of them actually believe in Jesus, and, 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 and I, I honestly don't know. I want to give Judas the benefit of the doubt. It's hard to, but I'd like to give him the benefit of the doubt and, said that, and say that he actually did believe in, in Jesus. But he went to the left. He went to the left. He exchanged the truth of God for a lie, the glory of God for an idol, and he was given over to the consequences of that. And this was by the sovereignty of God, just like it is for those of us who decide that we want to make idols. God will give us over to that, and he does it sovereignly according to Romans 8, 20 and following for the whole creation, us included, have been subjected to futility or frustration or meaninglessness, not by <coughs> our own will, but by the will of the one who subjected us, God. Why? In hope, in hope that the whole creation will be delivered from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of light. We have the hope that all of these frustrations are going to bring us into the glorious freedom of the children of light. And we have the same hope for every man who's ever turned to the left. That he will, our hope is, is that because he's turned to the left, as he increasingly goes to the left, more and more fertility, more and more frustration, more and more meaninglessness, that that is going to bring him to a point of repentance. But that's not what happens to Judas. That's not what happens to Judas. We'll get to that. Then let's take a look now at the crowd he was running with. So when you go to the left, go to the left, go to the left, you go with the left crowd. You don't go with the right crowd. And when you go to the left, this crowd has no allegiance to you. 
As long as they, okay, so the, the, the money ethic is, the, the ethic of money is, is that I have more money than you do, and I want to keep it that way. That's the money ethic. The gospel ethic is different. I have more faith than you, but I want you to have all the faith that I have and more. Two very different approaches to life. The money ethic and the gospel ethic. He was running with the money crowd because he, because he was a thief. He, he wanted money. He, got these, he sold Jesus out for money, but here's what happens. He says, I have sinned and I betrayed innocent blood. And they replied to him, what is that to us? We don't care about that. We don't care about you. We got what we wanted what is that to us? And anybody, any of us who've ever gone to the left, and we've all gone to the left at some point or another, when you go to the left, you, you know that as you betray the right and then have remorse, the people on the left, they're going to betray you. You're going to be left high and dry. You're going to be left alone. You're not going to have any friends. You're going to reject God's plan for your life, you're going to divorce your wife, and, and then all of your friends are going, to, are, are, are going to abandon you. And you're going to be left out there in a little tiny 600 square foot apartment all by yourself, lonely, friendless. And what's going to happen? It, whatever happens, it's not going to be good. Let's look what happened to Judas. What is that to us? They replied, that's your responsibility. So Jesus threw the money into the temple and left, and then he went out and he hanged himself. Whoops. So I wonder what Judas would have done if he would have been in a small group. I wonder how things might have turned out differently if he had been an accountability group and had, had a few brothers who, who cared about him and were doing uh, what brothers do for each other. But it didn't happen. The chief priest then picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this money into the treasury since it is blood money. They knew. They knew what they had done. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field. There was a, a field, and there's a place there, a traditional site for this still today, uh, where, where potters went, and there's a special kind of red clay down there, and they used... Uh, the potters went down there and they made pottery, so they called it the potter's field. It's not a pauper's field, although it is that now, uh, but a potter's field as a burial place for foreigners because of the uh, not, uh, not wanting to defile the, the remains of uh, true Israelites. This is why it is called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. So, what's the application in all this for you and me? Everyone betrays Jesus for money, okay? Everyone betrays Jesus for money. Sooner or later, everyone betrays Jesus for money. Who among us would claim, is there anyone among us that would claim that we've never betrayed Jesus for money? And so it could be, it could be that you, as a Christian, withhold important product information from the prospect, knowing that if the prospect knew that, they wouldn't buy this, the, the, the product. I hope that's not what happened to me with my trailer hitch, by the way, when my camper fell off my trailer hitch. <laughs> or, or maybe, maybe it is uh, using the name of Jesus for personal gain. Telling people you're a Christian so that you can get them to do business for you. That's betraying Jesus for money. Or, Maybe it's doing shoddy work as a believer. Taking the full pay but not doing the full amount of work. 
That's betraying Jesus for money. You see when I say, who among us has not betrayed Jesus for money? We've all betrayed Jesus for money at, at some point. Glossing over crucial information. So I heard a story about a, a, an elder in a church and had a young man in the church who was looking for a used car. And so the elder sold the young man the used car. It was completely rusted out underneath, but didn't disclose that information. Betraying Jesus for money. So we've all done it, but here is the big idea. Everyone does it. Everyone betrays Jesus for money, but it's what we do next that counts. It's what we do next that counts. Do we do what Judas did, or do we do what Peter did? Now, Peter was not uh, betraying Jesus for money, but he did. It, it, it's not, it should not go unnoticed that the gospel writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chose to put the story of Peter's denial and the story of the betrayal by Judas side by side. So, what is then, so he was filled with remorse. We know that that's what happened. And so what is the difference between remorse and repentance? He was seized with remorse. He returned the money, restitution. And then he said, I have sinned. This was an innocent man. Remorse. Is that enough? Is that enough? So, I have felt remorse recently. Last week, my wife and I went camping. And we were, we were, driving, we were driving down the road. I, I, I drove the camper up because I was afraid to have her in the camper after the trailer had she'd fallen off two times. So I had her fly up, and then I went over and picked her up at the airport. After I picked her up at the airport, I was driving uh, my wife uh, back to our, our campsite, uh, and there was this four-lane highway, wider and, and more than any, any roadway in our area here, for sure. And it was 11.42 p.m., because the plane was late, and there were no cars anywhere. And this was a road, okay, if you can go 70 on I-4, you ought to be able to go 95 on this road. It was that wide open. And there were no cars there. So I wasn't paying any attention to how fast I was going. And the next thing I know, blue lights, blue lights. And, uh, but I wasn't going that fast. I just wasn't paying any attention. What I missed was, is that on this wide open highway, the speed limit was 45. Oh! So the policeman pulls me over, Roy, and he says, Roy says, he says, he said, uh, uh, sir, do you know how fast you were going? Uh, I said, I have no idea, uh, but what's the problem? And he said, well, I clocked you going 62 and a 45. And I'm thinking, big deal. I have no remorse about this whatsoever. <laughs> but I tried to pretend that I felt remorse. <laughs> Roy was so cool about it. In fact, he even referred to his town as their town. He was embarrassed to stop me, you know, for doing that. So he knew what was going on. And so we had a nice chat, and he let me go. And, uh, and I gave, it was another book opportunity. So, hey, so I gave him a copy of The, the Man in the Mirror. <laughs> so I'm up to 16 books so far on this odyssey. But anyway. No, there is a difference between remorse and repentance. You can actually feel true moral guilt, all right? You can feel true moral guilt and not be repentant. So this word here, remorse, is related to the word that you bet noia, which is the word for repentance, but it's a different word. This word here, remorse, is a, 
is, is a change in how you feel. A change in how you feel. Repentance is a change of heart. So this is a change in feeling versus repentance, which is a change of heart. And that, that's the difference here. That's what's going on. So, what was Judas sorry for? He, he was sorry because he had betrayed the blood of an innocent man. But he didn't change his mind. No, instead in pride and self-sufficiency and rebellion, instead of turning to Jesus, this story could have had a different ending. <coughs> This story could have had a different ending. There's nothing that I, I'm not aware at least of anything in the prophecy about what was going to happen that, that said that Judas couldn't have come back and repented later. I'm not really aware of anything. This story could have had a different ending. It's what you do next that counts, Judas. But instead, instead he clung to that pride of life and he went out and he hanged himself. Everyone betrays Jesus for money. It's what we do next that counts. And so finally today, what can you do today if you've been tempted to betray Jesus for money? What can you do? So I've already asked the question, did, Jesus, did the story of Judas have to end like it did, and the answer, of course, is no. The story of Judas did not have to end like it did. How could it have been different? He could have done what Peter did. So, uh, we, so far, you've, we've only seen that in the denial of Jesus three times, by Peter, we've only seen so far that he wept bitterly. Did David uh, Delk, did he go forward and talk about the restitution of Peter? Okay, so we're gonna, we'll talk about the restoration uh, of, of Peter because of his deep, not only remorse, but also repentance. In other words, <clears throat> he did, <clears throat> he did something differently than Judas. He did something differently in Judas. And so the question is, what can you do, what can you do if you swallow the bait? What can you do if you see the bait dangling right in front of you right now like a little fishy, you see that little worm and, and you, just are so, you just so want to go out and bite on that worm as hard as you can not knowing that the fisherman is showing you the bait but hidden the hook. In the case in this, uh, fisherman in this case is the devil himself. He, in, in fishing, you show people the bait, but you hide the hook. You show the fish the, the, the bait, but you hide the hook. So what if you've already swallowed the bait or you're tempted to swallow the bait? You're, you're right now, you're thinking about uh, betraying Jesus for money. Or what if you already have uh, betrayed Jesus for money? What if, you, what, if you, what if you have just now maybe started to, to, to turn left, all right? You've been, you've been going right, but for whatever reason, you, you have started to go to the left. Maybe you haven't done anything wrong yet. Maybe you've turned left four or five times. Maybe you're way left. Maybe that's why, maybe that's why you're here, because you want to know how to get back to the right. You feel remorse. You know that you have true moral guilt, just like Judas did. You, you have said openly, I have sinned. What is still missing? Why can't you get it right? Why can't you get back to where you want to be or where you know you want to be? The answer is repentance. It's not just a change in how you feel about what has happened. It's a change of heart. It's saying, I no longer, I realize that I can no longer be in charge of my life. 
I need to surrender my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's the deal. That's what you need to do next. And so, hey, look, it's easy to go back to the left in this whole camper thing. So I needed about 50 little, uh, I, you know, every time I'd see a little something, a little problem, I would then go, go buy something. So I've, one thing was is uh, I, I apparently am very susceptible to insect bites. So I started buying the appropriate uh, insect repellents and anti-itch things, you know. So every time something happens, I go on Amazon. Uh, the awning on the camper was starting to, you look like the wind was going to rip it off. So I went and did some research. I found that you could buy some, some straps, you know, for $20 or something like that. And you screw into the ground and you hook to the awning and it keeps it from flapping. Well, there are about 50 things like that. And so like for about a month and a half, I'm on Amazon like every day buying something. And I'm a materialist, okay, I'm a recovering materialist, but I am a, a double recovering materialist, but I am. I have that in me, you know. Uh, fortunately for me, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's adultery, it's not abandoning Jesus, okay, it's just trying to have my cake and eat it too. But anyway, there I am, there I am, I'm buying stuff every day, every day, and, and all of a sudden I have everything I need. But I want to buy something anyway. Because it's coming back. It's coming back. What do I need to do? Feel bad about it? Have a change of feeling? Feel remorse? Well, I feel that. No, I've sinned. Well, you know, okay. I haven't quite done that yet. But anyway, the point is, just to, just to go back to repentance and surrender. So, men, as we close, where, where are you on all of this? Where are you on all of this? Because the big idea is it doesn't, you know, everybody does it. Everybody betrays Jesus for money, but it's what we do next that counts. It's what we do next that counts. And so as we close, what I'd like to do is I'd like to lead us in a, in a community prayer. Uh, you pray silently to yourself after me, if you want to. Um, and if you don't want to, uh, you know, name your child Judas. I don't care. But anyway, the, the, uh, <laughs> it's a prayer of repentance and surrender. And uh, in this whole area of, of betraying Jesus for money. <clears throat> and I'm sure that even if you don't need it for today, at least log this, this in the back of your mind so that if in the future, when and if, you should betray Jesus for money. You can come back to this, this, this line of reasoning, okay? Let us pray. Our dearest Father, we come to you humbly. We bow our heads and assume this posture of humility before you, uh, shunning the pride of life that has caused us to betray you, Jesus, for money, or to think about betraying you, Jesus, for money. And Lord, we do feel remorse for what we've done in the past or are doing now, but Lord, we don't want to just feel differently. We actually want to change our hearts. We want, and we know that we can't do that. that. It's only the gospel of Jesus that can change our hearts. And so we come now, Lord, and each of us in our own way, we, we pray this. Father, I have sinned. I do feel remorse. I have betrayed an innocent man. But more than that, I am truly sorry, and I repent. I want to be a different man. I don't want to just be the same man who feels sorrow. I want to be a different man. And I know that that happens by putting my complete faith in Jesus. So by faith right now, I repent, and I make a full, total, complete surrender of my life to you, Jesus and to your lordship over my life. Thank you for, give, for forgiving this sin in me and for accepting my repentance, putting your faith in me and receiving it back. And now I pray <clears throat> that you would show me 
where, where, what do I need to do with the 30 pieces of silver that I have taken inappropriately? Thank you for coming to me in this way this morning, Jesus. I pray this, in, this prayer in your loving name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and truth seekers of all kinds, we're excited to present Go Tandem. Just answer half a dozen questions about your spiritual journey, and our internally developed genome matches messages from the Bible that apply directly to you. All that's left is to start getting those messages throughout your day when you need them. That's like clearing a runway for the Holy Spirit. Whether you know a little bit about the Bible or a lot, Go Tandem will help you engage. We're a friend pedaling right with you, making the same trek you are. We'll be here to cheer, to prod, and to remind as you daily open your mind and spirit to God's Word and grow in your relationship with Jesus. Download it and give it a try. Go Tandem, right there with you.